Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson and welcome to lecture 5B in our construction uh, intro to construction management uh, course. Uh, today we're going to be looking at the bidding, bonding, pursuit of projects uh, area of construction. We talked about estimating in lecture 5A and we kind of know that if we mess up the estimate, that can be a pretty big disaster for us. So we have to be pretty careful about that. And there's some checks and balances in the system that we'll get into when we talk about the bonding process and what that means and how that um, affects our bidding processes as well. So construction bidding, there's usually some sort of public, in, especially if it's a government project, invitation to bid. Um, there's different avenues that it's advertised through, like the Daily Construction News is one avenue where you'll see invitations to bid. Uh, and uh, that's just putting out that you can bid on this project if you uh, comply with the pre-qualification for whatever the project may be. Um, so uh, there's a process and government projects have certain processes. Private projects might do it differently for a variety of different reasons. They might have preferred contractors that they want to just get quotes from, uh, or they can uh, put out a formal invitation to bid. So it's really that process of pulling together um, a pricing and putting in a bid and then being selected as the successful contractor and understanding what is it the client is looking at with the bid. Uh, people feel it's always money, but it's not always money. Sometimes it's got to do with time. Sometimes it's got to do with the confidence of the particular contractor. Uh, so there's some variation in that. Uh, government projects may be a little bit more so towards money because there's a lot of effort that goes into the pre-qualification process. So how do you say if contractor A pre-qualified, meaning they've done similar projects and they have um, the capability of doing it, they got the financing to do it, they've got the expertise to do it, and con contractor B has the same. If you're a government agency, how can you not give it to the lowest price? Because you're saying that they are both able to do it, you pre-qualified them, so, and it's taxpayer dollars. So those are some of the things that um, get, come into the, the bidding process and the pursuit of it. So there is this um, guide to CCDC is the Canadian Construction Documents Committee, and they have a bunch of standardized documents, including contracts. And so there's this guide to call uh, to calling bids and awarding construction contracts, and it really sort of gives um, the uh, processes and best practices and requirements in successfully bidding and awarding projects to avoid problems and issues. Because uh, there can be, and there can be legal actions, etc. If uh, uh, a contractor is unfairly awarded a contract, um, so by somebody else who spent their time bidding on it, you have to understand that putting together bids, these are expensive propositions on big projects. It costs a lot of money to put together a bid uh, on some of the private-public partnership hospitals. Uh, the the amount that you spend on putting to get together a bid for one of these projects can be in the millions of dollars and it's responding to an RFP. So you're not going to be too happy if you feel that the project was awarded unfairly when you spent millions of dollars putting together this bid. Not only that, you want to make sure you get your fair share out of those bids that you put in because you're going to go bankrupt if you keep putting in bids that you're you're spending millions of dollars on and never getting them. Now, if you get those projects, it's like a $1.4 billion project. That's a good project to have. So you can afford to lose a few as long as you're getting some of them. Um, but that's the process. And it follows rigid uh, procedures. And so you have to comply with the requirements um, stipulated by the owner. Uh, so if the owner says something in the bid documents, you better comply because that's then a reason why they don't have to accept your bid. So if you're supposed to put in a clearance certificate from WSIB and you forget to put it in, bid's gone. Like that's enough for them to um, not accept the bid. Uh, so these are things that um, occur all the time. And so there, you kind of go from this uh, conceptual drawings to design drawings to construction drawings, invitation to bid, uh, uh, to bid call, receiving the bids from the bidders, 
evaluation of the received bids, and then the contract uh, award. So there's this kind of process that goes in, uh, in here with the invitation to bid. And so in, obtain the bid information, decide whether or not, because they'll advertise it, or you might be called and notified about it. Well, you got to decide, is this something we want to do? Is this something we're competitive enough to be able to potentially win? Um, so you have to decide uh, whether that has that potential. Um, obtain the bid documents. Uh, you know, usually uh, fairly easy these days with electronic, uh, but um, you can get the printed copies. Arrange bonds and insurance. Divide the project into um, own forces. What are you going to do yourself and what are you going to sub out? Prepare a subcontract bid packages so that you can get bids uh, from the various subcontractors that you can pull together. Solicit the subs and obtain their prices. And that's the other thing you'll find that subcontractors, they like to give you their price at the very, very end, very close to when the bid is due because they don't want you bid shopping where you try to compare their price with others and try to um, lower somebody else based on somebody else's pricing, which is not ethical, by the way. Um, Solicit subcontractors, obtain their prices, estimate the GC's work for your own forces and your, your management fees, uh, price the general expenses, overhead and profit, and assemble a bid summary that you've got a listing, review it, make very sure that it's correct, and submit the bid. Sounds pretty straightforward, but it gets a little bit chaotic in this process here because, like I said, there's a lot of subs coming in with last-minute prices and you've got maybe... Uh, 45 minutes before it closes and you got to pull some of their prices together and you've got to be physically submitting the bid um, at the location. It can be a little bit um, hair raising and then there can be mistakes that are made and you don't want mistakes made in this process as we said in the previous lecture. So kind of just what we just said falls through here. Own forces, estimates, subs, prices general expense requirements, cash allowances, contingencies, things that would have been in the specifications and the general requirements, and then the add-ons, the bonds, insurance, and overhead uh, that we'll talk about uh, coming up, and what's your profit target margin, right? And then you add them all up and make sure you don't forget one of those line items. Now you think I'm joking. You'd be surprised what I've seen on bids. Uh, we used to price a lot of publicly uh, uh, public government projects and I was always the one that would bring the bid in and uh, it, when it's a public project they would you have to submit it by a certain time so if it's 11 o'clock if it's 1101 and the clock hits it it's a no-go it's not it's no good uh, so it has to be at the time very very strict no jokes and so don't get stuck in traffic make sure you're there ahead of time I usually hang out in a coffee shop uh, across the street, used to be on Young Street where we used to do a lot of our government uh, placements just south of St. Clair. And you go in and then one hour later from when you submit, so if you submit at 11 at 12 o'clock, they will come down a committee and they will line up and then they will open the bids one by one. They'll announce who the company is. Uh, sometimes they were just numbered companies, Ontario 54321, or in our case, they would say Simon Stevenson Contracting and then they would announce the bids and you would be writing down the bids as they're announcing them and if you were the low bid you would get the project that's pure and simple because they would also review the documents if the if the insurance wasn't there or the bond wasn't there or was something wasn't signed properly it would be disqualified and so then you'd know so you didn't want to make any mistakes in that particular area because then you wasted all that time and money estimating the project and so you're sitting there and they're opening these bids and let's say uh, our bid was uh, two million dollars right and you're sitting there and the first bid they open is three million dollars three million dollars your bids two million dollars not good Next bid they opened two million nine hundred thousand dollars. Really not good because you're going to get this project and you think you're going to you must have forgot something. You must have missed one of these line items. You're panicking. You're I can remember the the blood pressure going up and hearing my heartbeat. And then all of a sudden, one point nine million dollars. 
And now you know you're not getting this project. And the next one's 1 1.95 and 2 million and 50 and 2 million 100. And you were kind of like right in the zone, but you're not the low price. And that is what happens. Now, why you're asking, would somebody be at 3 million or 2.9? You know, they priced it high. It wasn't their thing. Or they were pricing something else that day and they thought they'd throw in a bid and maybe, just maybe, other people didn't price it or if they did, they were throwing in a bid too. And then you get it and then that could be um, a win for you. I remember we had a project in Hamilton uh, while well, there was a, a, a window project and we had done a lot of window uh, replacements, uh, government uh, projects. And uh, our window supplier phoned and said, you know, I haven't had any calls on this project because it, it was a government project. They were one of the stipulated supplier. Just wanted to let you know, you know, I know it's Hamilton. Maybe you don't want to go there, but I haven't had any, I haven't had anybody ask me for a quote, right? And so I thought about it and I go, I don't really want to go to Hamilton. Da, da, da. If I were to go to Hamilton, this would be a motivation. So you mark up the profit that you want you know, instead of uh, instead of maybe going for eight uh, percent or ten percent, you say thirty percent. All right, forty percent, and you mark it up. And then when they actually um, open the bids, and you had it up forty percent, and there was only one other bid, and guess what? The other bid was from Toronto too. And guess what? They didn't want it even. They wanted it even less than we did got that project. So that's what happens sometimes, not often. That's just, uh, I won't forget that one, but uh, you know, uh, that's why sometimes you might see that as well. On it, now, if you're sitting there and you had a $3 million bid and somebody has a $2 million bid and they're the only one and everybody else is like 2 million, 900, 3 million, 100, 3 million and 50, then that person with 2 million made a mistake. And if it's a publicly trade, if it's a public project, we'll get into bonding, then, which is next. That's where bonding comes in. And so bonding is a guarantee that in the event the contractor does not perform as stated, the bonding company, an independent third party known as a surety. Basically, they're like an insurance company. Usually we always got our bonding through an insurance company will cover the owner for damages in the amount of the bond. Hmm. But what do I mean by that? Hmm. There's different types of bonds, right? So we'll talk about three of them. A bid bond. So it's a, it's a government project. They want a bid bond, 10% of the amount. It's what was our example. They think they feel it's a $3 million project. So they want a $300,000 bid bond. All right, so you've got this bid bond from a surety saying that you are going to, if your pro bid is accepted, you're going to build this project. So if you're that contractor that was $2 million, there's a bid bond on this, you're a million cheaper. It's not like you can say, hey, guys, I made a mistake. It's okay, I don't want to do this. Give it to the next one. It's theirs. No, they're going to take your bid bond, right? Yeah, you don't have to do it. They're going to take your bid bond. And the bonding company is going to come after you for that $300,000. And you're not going to be able to bid on other projects again. So that's a gotcha for sure, right? So you better be serious about your estimates when you're pulling together a bid. Uh, you've got your reputation of the company. You've got your bonding rating. You've got a lot at stake in those examples. So it's serious business. So that's why you get especially when it's your own company and you're dropping off these bids and you're listening to them, it really is an intense affair. So it's difficult for a contractor to get a bond if you're not, you know, you're not in a good financial position. You don't have a history of doing that type of project or size of projects. They always put a limit to how much you can be bidding on depending on your financial stability. So it takes a long road of steps to really um, get up there. It's kind of like a pre-qualification process for contractors in a way. Um, and the cost of the bond, of course, you know, when you when you have to have bonds, well, there's costs associated with that. So you include that in your pricing, right? Um, so there's extra costs. Most, most non-government projects aren't necessarily bonded. It's big though in government projects because you have to protect the taxpayer's interests, right? 
Um, so it's one of those things. So there's actually three types of bonds. I've mentioned the bid bond, uh, as we were saying. So the bid bond it indicates the company's ability to access performance and payment bonds. Surety company agrees to pay stipulated amount to the owner if the company forfeits the bid. Uh, and so on. A lot of people ask me why I always have US dollars on this. I believe you're not supposed to use Canadian dollars on, on print, believe it or not. Uh, but anyways, um, so surety company agrees to pay the stipulated amount to the owner if the company forfeits the bid. Um, so that's going to be their responsibility. It ensures the seriousness of the bid. So you're not playing games. Otherwise, people would be playing games, right? We don't want people to play games. We want people to be serious about it. Bid bond, they're going to be serious about it. Government, they want you to be serious about it. Uh, so, um, depending on the conditions of the bond, the owner has the right to collect value of the bond, require the bonding company to pay the difference between the submitted bid and is submitted as part of the tendering process, the bidding process. I still tend to use this word tendering process. They like to say bidding nowadays. So, forgive me a little bit if I say tendering. You'll, you'll get people my age that say tendering a lot, but the it's more just a, the bidding process. So if you never learned that one, it's probably okay. Just think bidding process. Um, when I was writing my book for the U.S. publisher, I got a little bit of schooling on that. So uh, at least in the U.S. Um, contractor, surety, owner. So contractor, surety, owner. Um, so that's the insurance company and that's the client, right? And this is you if you're the contractor. And so they're, they're take, basically you're giving indemnifying them to look after the bonding and the ob secondary obligations should you not come through. But they will come after you if you don't come through because they'll have to pay that money to the owner. And so for you to not come through, it should be like you're bankrupt and so they're not going to get anything from you anyways because probably the creditors already have you. Okay, the performance bond. We've got to have some fun here with Elvis Presley. Uh, performance you're performing something right uh, so he was a pretty good performer um, performance bond is about doing the work so bid bond is about getting the work performance bond is about doing the work are you performing um, to the contract uh, have, is there something that has happened that you no longer can complete the contract uh, probably bankruptcy that sort of thing I think uh, you could probably look up bond field um, in the last few years, they're probably one, Carillion, uh, another one, Olympian, York, um, you know, there's ones that at certain points probably had performance bond issues. Um, so if you had uh, bankruptcy and things like that, that could be um, some of those uh, issues that could come up um, during that. If you're not unable to complete a project that you started and a bonding company has to take it over. So if they ask for a performance bond, it's typically going to be in the 50 to um, hundred percent zone of the project and what that means is if you bid the project at uh, one billion dollars and you're you can't complete it then if it costs up to a billion dollars to complete that's what you're covered for um, so it's the it's that amount um, if it costs if you're if you started it and you did 200 million dollars worth of work and it was a billion dollar bond and it cost Two billion to finish it because you were drastically underpriced. Well, it'll only cover for a billion up, to whatever the bond amount is. All right, but it does protect the owner a lot. It does protect the taxpayer a lot, right? Um, so it's only whatever the differences are. Um, so and it's really in the difference, not of the value, not in um, the amount, right? So. Because the client still would have had to pay out that billion dollars to build them. They're not building the rest of the building for free for you. It's just in the difference of the extra that you would have had to pay. I think I might have worded that a little bit dicey back there, but that's what I meant. If it's a billion dollars, the client pays the billion. Uh, it's just that if it's costing a lot more because the other contractor, to get somebody else to come in part way into a co project, nobody's coming in part way on a really uh, on a project half done or a third the way done at the cheapest price because they're concerned about what was done prior and how they're going to join up to it there's a lot of other concerns so it's not going to be the same pricing as it was originally so if the new bids are that much more um, the owner still probably would only end up paying the original billion dollars if as long as the bonding amount covers the amount that was over
payment bond has to do with liens and liens is a very complicated aspect of construction uh, basically it ensures payments to subcontractors to employees and to contractors so there's different levels that uh, liens can be paid out off at um, so a payment bond just means if a subcontractor wasn't paid by a GC and the client uh, paid this general contractor but a general contractor didn't pay their subcontractor subcontractor could put a lien on the client's property but if there's a payment bond then they're going to be protected for whatever that amount it's not going to end up being them at somehow um, at fault so it's a protection it's an insurance to protect the client that way So they don't guarantee trouble-free jobs, but they do give a certain, it's a base, it's a, a way of assigning risk away from the owner. There's a cost to it, uh, but it's a, a way of assigning risk away from the owners. So construction insurance, of course, we have to have differing levels to cover us for all the other stuff that can happen on site. Uh, we have... Um, our uh, liability insurance that we have to have we have omissions insurance that we have for designs uh, we have to be protected against certain risks um, uh, that um, like uh, accidents fire flood damage to property lawsuits that may occur all of these potential items so we definitely have to have all kinds of construction insurance because lots of things can happen on projects when you've got lots of heavy equipment lots of things in motion there can be lots of things that go on. And um, when we talk about this, pulling this together, that you're actually got the insurance, you got the bonds, you estimated it successfully, and you're doing the build of the project, you have to be able to monitor your costs. And the construction cost control is, as the project is proceeding, measuring what your costs are and comparing it to what your budget is. And are you over budget or under budget? And you'll find some things you're over budget, some things you're under budget. And is overall this working out to our target uh, profit amount? And this is very important to do this because it gives you really valuable feedback in situ and process that you know how you're doing at any point in time. And also extremely valuable data for future projects. Like you could get down your pricing per square meter pretty well on uh, condominium buildings and then you just have to factor in differences in inflation differences in location and design but you'd have a pretty good idea and a handle on that and that would then if you're a developer tie into um, what you're potentially able to get on your sales and then then you can look at the difference and that's going to be um, your return on your investment when you're a developer um, a big thing is your return on the investment because you can leverage certain things and it's a big deal. There's profit from a developer's point of view, and that's, you know, uh, we take the lump sum of what we have, and we take basically the cost of everything, and then that's our, our profit. Our return on investment is, well, maybe we only used 25% of the capital, and we financed the rest. And with that financing, um, we leveraged it. And so instead of making 10% profit, we make... 50% profit because it's leveraged that and it's not profit sorry wrong word return on investment so that we get basically double our return on investment that would be a hundred percent return on investment right so that would be very advantageous for us as a developer as a constructor it doesn't work that way the same the same ways necessarily but for developers it can work that way in a big way and that's um that's an important consideration because as a developer, you could put your money in the bank and get, well, right now, maybe one quarter of 1%. Uh, or you could put it into what you do really well and get a much bigger return. But there's risk. Mess up the estimates. Mess up the acquisition of the land. Mess up the, uh, the project management process and then you could lose it all, especially when it's leveraged, very easy. Cost control includes establishing the baseline or the budget estimate, measuring variation of the actuals from the baseline budgets and taking corrective action. That's what I was just mentioning. Monitoring uh, cost performances to detect variances, 
variance and variability in projects, it's the bane of our existence. We try to reduce the variances, the variability, so we can improve the predictability. Uh, ensuring that all appropriate changes are recorded accurately in the cost baseline. And I would also, in another lecture, talk about the schedule baseline. Prevent incorrect or inappropriate or unauthorized changes. So we want to make sure that when we have changes that they're accounted for properly and they're brought into the budget and added to the budget and that we're compensated for them properly. Um, and that's the last bullet. So comparison uh, is important, watching the variances, doing recoveries, uh, getting our budgets back on track, and keeping the data for future opportunities uh, so that we can ensure that we don't make uh, the same mistake twice and that we build our database really, really well with this information uh, going forward. So. It's very helpful from those perspectives and the way that we can manage data today has become so easy it's important to do that. So construction cost control really is uh, involving a number of uh, practices and uh, systems to try to avoid uh, projects that run out of control. It's to keep them in control, to try to reduce waste and it's really part of the overall interactive uh, process of being successful in project management. We have to be able to estimate good, have a good effective plan in the beginning. We have to be able to execute effectively, collect feedback. We have to be able to iterate and adjust and pivot. Uh, and we have to be constantly vigile about uh, reducing waste and adding value to the clients so that they'll want more business from us. And if we do all of those things and we're part of the team that does all of those things and make this part of our processes, systems, habits, routines, rituals, we're going to be very successful as a company. And that picture up there, if you noticed, has got two staircases. And when you make mistakes and you have to have a, an extra staircase because of a zoning change, a zoning issue that you didn't comply properly with, this is very expensive when you got to do this, take this out, fix this put in the stairs here, put in the railings. That kind of messes up your budgets, right? And that messes up even the most well-laid estimates. So while an estimate can sink you, so can uh, project management not being properly executed, execute you, uh, um, sink you as well. So hopefully that's uh, pulling everything together and you're getting an idea of sort of the processes and the positions of what an estimator does and what project managers do as far as project control and monitoring uh, at a high level and pieces of the puzzle week by week, uh, lecture by lecture, will start to come together. So I'm Tom Stevenson. I want to wish you a wonderful day and I'm signing off for now. Have a great weekend.